Sea of Thieves? We need to talk. Okay, maybe a little too dramatic, but I feel there are some huge opportunities with Sea of Thieves as we enter into the latter half of 2024. It may surprise some people, but Sea of Thieves has been around for over six years now, with 118 updates and patches applied to the game since its 1.0 launch in March of 2018. And I was there at the launch. I remember those times. The sea was in front of us, wind behind us, skull fort in the sky, and the pirate sandbox at our fingertips. It felt cool, but it also felt empty. Players today perhaps don't realize just how much has been added to the original version of the game over the years. The brigantine, skeleton ships, the devil's roar, megalodons, fishing, tall tales, the fort of the damned, other world events, and those are just some of the big ticket items. Yes, fishing is a big ticket item. Fight me. There were also plenty of quality of life updates added to the game as well. Rowboats, harpoons, storage crates, more food options, the emissary system, sovereigns, turn-ins, and lots more. I'm saying all these things so that viewers understand that this video is not a teardown of what Rare has built in Sea of Thieves. They've put a lot of sweat into this game, and I truly do believe they desire it to be the best they feel it can be. Here's the problem. Sea of Thieves is a live service game. That means that, for better or for worse, there's an expectation of constant updates, including new content regularly coming out. And for the most part, Sea of Thieves does this pretty well. Rare has broken down development into periods of time that we know as seasons, and they iterate at least three or more seasons in advance, as recently revealed during the 2024 preview event. That means that approximately a year of development is already planned before we even get into the finer details. But that does come at the expense of current content. There have been multiple occasions where a piece of content has been released, but then seemingly never reviewed or updated since. I'm looking at you, Quest Board. We're going to look at two specific pieces of content here that have been released in the past couple of years that I believe are due for a rework. Hourglass and Guilds. Let's start with Hourglass. We've had the Hourglass function, along with the Guardians of Fortune and Servants of the Flame factions, in-game since November of 2022, and at launch, it was lauded as the way to get your PvP craving in. New accommodations, new rewards like the Skeleton Curse and Ghost Curse, in a quote-unquote fast way to hop into a battle right from your starting outpost. But it's been nearly two years. Where does Hourglass stand today? Well, battles have remained the same. You either match with a sloop, brig, or galleon depending on your ship and engage in battle, sink them or be sunk, and then start the rotation all over again. If you win enough and become a champion, you can face a larger crew for no extra benefit. You grind for reputation and rewards between levels 1 to 200, and then grind again to level 1000 and 10,000 if you're part of the Insanity Club. Queues are becoming longer and longer in general, with faster queues during boosted reputation events like Community Weekend and Golden Glories. And the skill-based matchmaking system is iffy at best, due to the apparent disinterest from the larger player base. This is sounding very similar to what happened with Arena, and I believe it needs to be looked at with urgency, lest the same fate befall it. So what can Rare do? First, I would suggest a block of time similar to Gold Rush that offers boosted allegiance. It could be an hour each day, or it could be a full day like what we used to have with Fort Fridays. This would give a little extra incentive outside of special events to participate in Hourglass. This next one's a little controversial, but I do believe that Hourglass matches should have a shrinking circle. Why? Two reasons. One, it eventually forces players to engage with each other in a timely manner. And two, it prevents the stubbornness that some players have around running and chasing that extends matches out to 30 minutes, an hour, two hours long, that leaves a bitter taste in people's mouths and afterwards makes them not want to play again. And you may say, well, one of them should just scuttle. But ask yourself this question. If you're in a match, streak in hand, maybe with flags on board, and you're facing off with a runner, would you want to scuttle? No. Stubbornness and the instinct to teach the opponent a lesson that they're wasting your time take over. So instead, just time the match and win or lose, you'll be back on the seas much faster than without. Next, why do many players fall out of love with Hourglass? It's due to the nature of competition. There will always be players who practice more regularly and will naturally become better at combat versus those who just hop in on occasion as time allows. And you may have heard complaints about facing off against opponents with curses when they themselves are still learning. How do you solve for this? 
In my opinion, a great way to both incentivize and motivate players would be to offer a boosted legions gain in open crew. Give players the ability to flag that they're interested in hourglass and match lower ranked players with those that are higher ranked. That way, when paired up, there's an opportunity for both a greater reward for each player, as well as a way for the newer player to learn more from the more experienced player. That way, the motivation is there by playing together versus potentially just against each other. And I know that the majority of the competitive PvP community, for all the finger pointing that it sometimes gets, would love an opportunity to teach and help lift others to engage in PvP more. This next one's an easy update to implement, and honestly, I'm surprised it hasn't been put in place yet. But let champions earn additional allegiance if they decide to face off against larger crews. Right now, there's zero incentive for a sloop to choose to fight a brig or a galleon. It's just all risk, zero additional reward. Give players the opportunity to face off in more than just a 1v1 ship battle. This would tie into guilds, which we'll discuss later on, but a 2v2 or 3v3 ship battle would be all sorts of epic that would really showcase the best of what Sea of Thieves combat has to offer. And that brings me to the probably the biggest change I'd make in Hourglass. I'd keep it off regular adventure servers and put it on its own server. This would allow for a number of different benefits. One, it could potentially keep the action flowing by ensuring that there's empty servers always available for ships to spawn into. Two, it would allow for what I mentioned earlier about additional ships on each side. Three, it would offer an opportunity to even the playing field when it comes to supplies. Instead of potentially one ship winning because they had X number of supplies more than the other, you'd be able to keep all supplies the same and make it entirely skill-based. This would also remove the argument around whether or not it's legitimate to use items like cursed cannonballs or more recently bone callers and hourglass. If it's in this mode, now you have no excuse. Give players the incentive to grind through levels 200 to 1000. Guilds get commendations available to unlock at higher distinctions. Trading companies get fancy rings from levels 100 to 500. There's an opportunity here to make sure that we can decrease the drop off between folks getting their first ghost or skeleton curses and then going for gold afterwards. Lastly, make players feel like Hourglass matters in the long term strategy of the world of Sea of Thieves. There's an area in each of the hideouts where the Chronicler NPCs, Samuel and Hammer and Anvil, are supposed to inform players about how the battle for the Sea of Thieves is going between the Guardians of Fortune and the Servants of the Flame. But in all the times that I've gone to speak with them, the info they provide is practically the same. In addition, we haven't seen any changes made to the game world specifically due to Hourglass since the mode launched. Yes, we're about to see the return of Flameheart and with that the new Reaper fortifications on various islands, but that's due primarily to storytelling, not specifically to the war between the Guardians and the Servants of the Flame. Let's move on to guilds. Guilds were introduced back in October 2023, so we're a little less than one year in. And I think there's a framework guilds holds up, but there are several major pain points for guilds that really prevent it from being the highlight for Sea of Thieves that it could be. First, there's not a lot of functionality as far as what you can do with your guild inside of Sea of Thieves. In many other games that offer guild systems, there are core features that are expected to enhance the experience of the player by joining a guild. For example, a guild chat. Now, other games have guilds on the same server. Sea of Thieves does not offer this. So a guild chat would have to span across servers. But we can see that some of that functionality is already in place because you're able to see that another ship has set sail from your guild regardless of what server it's on, whether it's in the EU, North America, so on. Guild chats would also offer players a way to not feel alone even when they're sailing alone. And if they come across something that they may want help in, or are interested in doing with others, say a treasure vault or a turn into reaper's hideout, they could simply ping the guild chat and everyone who was online at that time could be notified and maybe have made available to assist. Another major feature to guilds in other games is the ability to host a guild house, or in this case, hideout, where all the players of the guild could come together and enjoy the labors and achievements of the guild through cosmetics and other customizations in a unique environment that only they could access. Now, I understand the difficulty in creating that sort of environment within the general adventure sandbox, but allow me to offer an alternative. Give guild players a special voyage at their table that allows them to traverse the Sea of the Damned and go direct to their unique guild hideout. Since it's away from adventure, players wouldn't have to worry about others encroaching. In addition, you could theoretically host a full server within that one area. 
much like a custom server. Just imagine a full guild of 24 players present in their special town, their special island, their special fortress. It would make guilds way more meaningful than just another tick on the progression scale. Let's also figure out a way to systemize guild conflict. Perhaps whole guilds could pledge themselves to guardians or servants, and then that way, guilds could wage war with each other with benefits to both individual player hourglass experience as well as a new experience for guild rankings in hourglass. Special guild-focused events could also be introduced. Extra gold, reputation, or even unique cosmetics for completing events as a guild would be a boon. And lastly, unless we can figure out a way to build a better guild recruitment system within the game, a scaled XP structure, depending on the amount of people within a guild, would serve as encouragement that anyone can partake in the system and not feel left behind. There is one more topic that I want to bring up, and that does involve the story of Sea of Thieves. We've been on a bit of a roller coaster the past couple of years. Tall Tales have been a staple of the game since the anniversary update about a year after launch, and then in 2022, the concept of limited time adventures was released. Now, two years later, adventures are dead and buried. But how are players supposed to learn about the stories that occurred within that time span? This is not an easy subject, and other games, most famously Destiny 2, suffer from the same issue, where content is locked away from the player base in order to streamline the story that the developers want to focus on. We saw the results of this where, over the span of a few weeks, Tasha was cured of her skeleton curse basically off-screen, through the memories of Briggsy and the help of the Sword of Souls. But the impact of this dialogue text compared to how we actually went on a quest to complete and learn more about this story in real time pales in comparison. It's my hope that one day all players will be able to experience those limited time adventures and even events that had previously taken place in the game, like the group summoning of the Meg in the Hungering Deep or the skeleton ship invasion of Sea of Thieves in Curse Sails. This is obviously something that would require a lot of thought and design mechanics around and thus probably the reason why it's taken a back seat to new and fresh content that's currently being developed. But I want to be clear. I'm excited for the future of Sea of Thieves. I can't wait to finally see Captain Flameheart in person and take on the Burning Blade in physical form. I want to know what these new fortresses are going to mean for Sea of Thieves moving forward. And I want to know what the Dark Brethren are plotting in the background and who is Captain? There are certainly plenty of myths about him. And if you want to learn more about other Sea of Thieves myths, I've got a video for you to go to right here. Subscribe for more, like if you enjoyed, so long, and take care.